Hello and welcome to the Buy, Sell, Hold Spotlight presented by Sports Car Market Magazine. I'm Darren Roberge. Before we begin, please take a moment to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Also be sure to join in the conversation and share your thoughts below. Our guest today is David Swig. He is a senior car specialist with the Broad Arrow Group. Welcome, David. Thank you, Darren. I really appreciate you having me on the show today. Absolutely. For those who may not be familiar, why don't you give a little bit of background and introduce yourself? Uh, Darren, so um, as you kindly introduced me, my name is David Swig. I'm a car specialist with Broad Aero Group. Uh, I have been around the car world my entire life, uh, thanks to a sort of a family upbringing in cars. Uh, my dad, uh, Martin, was a collector and vintage racer and all around uh, car guy. So sort of grew up in the car hobby, uh, going to the racetrack, going to Concours events, that sort of thing. And uh, when I graduated university and trying to figure out how to make a living, uh, I gravitated towards the the thing that I knew best, which was uh, cars. And um, having grown up as the son of a car dealer, I guess I sort of naturally gravitated towards collector car auctions. So I uh, started my auction career in 2010 uh, with another auction house, Bonhams, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, went to RM Sotheby's in 2015 and then uh, left in the early part of 2022 to become one of the founding partners of Broad Arrow Group. Uh, which of course was a joint venture partnership with, with Haggerty. So it's been a, a great ride. And, uh, you know, my dad always said that he never felt like he worked a day, uh, working in the car business because he loved it so much. And, um, fortunately that applies to most days for me. Yeah. It's a good spot to be. No doubt about that. So broad arrow group, uh, a lot going on, especially, uh, uh, going into what's getting ready to happen here in a couple of weeks. Why don't you recap us on some of the latest news with broad arrow and what's happening in that world? Yeah, uh, absolutely, Darren. You know, we just have celebrated our one year anniversary of uh, the formation of Broad Arrow Group. It's been uh, a very exciting and uh, busy first year. Uh, we did uh, just uh, close to $90 million in auction sales in 2022 across three, uh, uh, three live auctions. We had 17 auction record prices uh, during those events. Um, we also have a, a private brokerage, a private sales division called Collector's Garage, uh, www.collectorsgarage.com. Uh, in 2022, we completed over 60 uh, individual private treaty transactions. So that has uh, been going quite well. And we also do collector car lending, uh, which you may have heard about. We have a, a subsidiary called Broad Arrow Capital, where we do both acquisition financing for collector cars and equity release for people who are looking to borrow money against their existing cars and collections. So we built out the loan book to in excess of $30 million uh, starting 2023 and growing uh, rapidly. Um, and of course, we've launched our Haggerty Marketplace online auctions as well. Uh, so we have, uh, as you said, a lot going on these days. Yeah, truly a one-stop shop for uh, collectors and enthusiasts alike. Uh, part of that portfolio also is uh, Amelia Island, which we are approaching now, uh, now renamed the Amelia. Why don't you uh, provide a little bit of an overview of the event and kind of give us the process from going from, you know, a, 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 the purchase of the event to to creating the event itself to moving in now to uh, to what's getting ready to happen here in early March. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Amelia Island, of course, is one of the uh, uh, benchmark events on the North American collector car calendar, um, you know, together with, with Pebble Beach. Uh, Amelia and Pebble are probably the two. Uh, most prestigious Concours events in, in North America anyways. Uh, so we always look forward to going to Amelia every year. Of course, a lot of uh, market activity going on that weekend as well with uh, several auctions taking place. So uh, with Haggerty's acquisition of the uh, formerly the Amelia Island Concours d'Elegance from Bill Warner, now known as the Amelia, uh, we will be hosting our Broad Aero Group auction in the center of all the action at the Ritz-Carlton. Uh, which is sort of the the nucleus of the Amelia Concours weekend, if you will. Uh, so we'll be presenting a uh, selection of uh, uh, a number of cars. We're, we're still finalizing our our book of business, our consignments for Amelia Island as we speak, and nailing down final details for our auction schedule and uh, all those uh, good things. Uh, but marching right along, we're going to have a great auction event, um, and uh, that's coming right up just around the corner in the first uh, weekend of March. Yeah, well, let's dive into some of the cars that you already have announced that are on offer uh, upcoming here in early March. Uh, let's start right at the top. 1961 Mercedes-Benz 300 SL Roadster, as we know, one of only 250 Roadsters produced in the 1961 model year. A uh, factory-equipped four-wheel Dunlop disc brakes, uh, retains its original that matching numbers chassis, engine, and body, uh, and it comes with a fantastic Becker Mexico radio, um, and uh, it's a well-documented, well-known example since new. Great touring car. 
fun to drive. These are amazing cars that I think probably get a little bit overshadowed by the going, but in my opinion, they're, I think, better cars than the going. What are your thoughts on these? Yeah, you know, I mean, the, the going has maybe the more timeless sort of design, uh, but a roadster is a far more practical car. The, the problem with go wings is they, they get very warm inside. They, they don't have very adequate ventilation. So especially if you have to drive one, uh, you know, through Arizona on a hot day, it's maybe not the best choice, uh, which is why you, you often see people driving their go wings at low speeds with the go wing doors open, like around a race paddock or something like that, just to get some airflow. So. The Roadster is probably the more uh, practical choice, uh, candidly speaking. Uh, this car actually is from uh, a great friend and client of mine who I've known for a number of years, who's a an avid uh, enthusiast and rallyist. And this is a car that, uh, you know, is built for driving and he has driven it. He's done a number of rallies in it, including uh, three times, I think, on the California Melee, which is a rally that uh, is now part of the Haggerty portfolio, but, but one that which uh, my father actually started by. Uh, organized for, for a number of years. So this car has sort of proven itself on the open road. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, sharing the road with it on a number of occasions. And yeah, it's just a great spec. Um, you know, you, you pointed out that it is a disc brake car. Uh, the, the earlier 300 SL Roadsters had the uh, earlier style drum brakes, then they upgraded to the discs, I think, for 1961. So that's definitely a big selling point, um, have that increased stopping power. Uh, especially if you're going on any uh, mountain rallies and on any long downhill grades, uh, good to have that peace of mind. Uh, but yeah, great example. Um, it, it's really beautifully presented. It's a car that's never really been completely restored, just kind of maintained and, and kept up over the decades. And, uh, you know, it does have a contrasting a black hardtop, I believe, as well as an exquisite set of fitted luggage. So ready for sort of all weather enjoyment and, you know, would be a great tour car for, for somebody. Yeah, pretty hard to beat seeing the world in a 300 SL uh, Roadster, no doubt about that. Uh, you're a pretty well-known guy as a vintage racer, and this car caught my eye, and, and uh, we'll, we'll see if we're kind of both pointing in the same direction on this. There's a pretty specific reason why I like this car. Uh, 1969 Ferrari 365 GTB4, GTB4 uh, competition, but it's a conversion, and that's kind of why I like it. Um, it benefits from a, a com comprehensive engine rebuild, a differential rebuild done in 2016, Originally constructed as a left-hand drive plexi nose car. It, 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 this is an interesting vehicle because for me, it's something that you can actually use. I know we see guys in videos at Goodwood wiping out in 250 GTOs and that kind of thing. So people definitely do want to race the real bona fide, you know, uh, examples of these cars. But it seems like this is a better deal kind of in a lot of ways because again, it, we talk on the show a lot about experiences. And it seems like you could have a lot of experiences in this car. Give us the rundown here. I would absolutely agree with that, Darren. Um, the Daytona has always been one of my favorite Ferraris. I just have always loved the sort of muscular look of the car. Um, you know, Daytonas were raced. There were factory prepared competition versions. However, Ferrari, as far as I'm aware, and uh, I'm not Marcel Massini here, so, so don't quote me if I get this wrong, but uh, I believe they only made 15 factory uh, competition cars. Um, so therefore, those are in very, very scarce supply. And, you know, for the longest time, um, you know, people took old Ferraris and modified them for track use. This car, I believe, was converted to competition spec uh, sometime in the 1980s, I believe, by uh, Roloffs in the Netherlands. Um, so, you know, yeah, as you said, here you can have a car that has the look of a factory comp car. Uh, but has the price of essentially a normal street car and would be eligible for all sorts of different events. And uh, th there's not many cooler looking uh, sort of modified production cars than a, a comp spec Daytona. So I'm, I'm fully on board and also kind of cool that it, it's an early car that had the plexi nose because that's actually uh, sort of the rarest Daytona body style before they went to the pop-up lights. I think they only were mm, maybe 400 or so plexi nose cars delivered. So Kind of cool. Um, obviously, it's it's been uh, changed from what it left the factory as, but it's a very, very cool hot rod. Yeah, it's really, really neat for sure. And it comes with the latest FIA paperwork. Also, a uh, uh, rear spoiler included in a set of Campanella wheels. So, like, it kind of does a lot. And again, we talk experiences a lot on the on this on this show. It's it's one of the reasons why we do this in the first place. The fact that it's eligible to do what it is to do with the price point that it's ultimately going to come in at is really a neat deal. So, this should be a good car for somebody. Another good Ferrari that you have, and, and I feel like these are a little bit on the underappreciated side, 
we always seem to ask, you know, when is the time? When is the time? When is the time? Because these, these, these cars do check a ton of boxes. A 1982 Ferrari 512 BBI, uh, exceptional condition of uh, Berlinetta boxer, 12,000 miles on it or 12,000 kilometers, excuse me. A uh, little, you know, a little over uh, 7,700 original miles on it. Original Rossa Corsa over, over Nero. Uh, believed to be one of 27 um, uh, special edition uh, uh, boxers wearing the designer wool inserts on the seats, door panels, headliner, etc. And it's the final Ferrari featuring entirely hand-built construction. I, we've had people on the show a lot, of, uh, a lot of times over the course of the last year talk about in the buy sell, sell, buy, sell, hold section that these cars are poised for a jump, but it always kind of seems like when, 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 when. Do you think now is the time? Are we getting to that point where this body style is maybe starting to make sense? You know, Darren, your, your crystal ball probably works about as well as mine, and, and I don't uh, uh, claim to be able to time the market. Um, what I will say is, you know, the Berlinetta Boxer uh, is a car that has always captured my interest. Um, you know, that this body style was introduced as the 365 Berlinetta Boxer in, I believe, 1974, um, essentially, you know, taking the uh, drivetrain from a Daytona and putting it in a mid-engine application. And it was really, arguably, I think, kind of the beginning of Ferrari adopting the uh, principles of wedge shape styling and, you know, doing things like you saw Lamborghini doing with the Countach. And, and that sort of design language is carried, you know, all the way through the, the V8 Ferraris of the 80s with the 308s and, and 328s and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, I think arguably the 365 uh, Boxer, uh, which was the predecessor to the 512 uh, series, uh, is, is where that all started. Um, and, and the 512 BBI that we're offering is sort of the, uh, you know, end of the line of, of that series of cars being the fuel injected version, uh, with the, the 512 motor. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I would agree. I mean, these cars have, have, you know, except for all but the best examples have sort of been trading in the, the low mid $200,000 range for some time. And, you know, I think they're very cool cars and on an intrinsic, uh, relative value basis, I think there's a lot to say about them and, and why they represent uh, arguably a potentially good investment. These are cool cars. I mean, you open them up too, and they're kind of like a, a living, breathing architectural CAD drawing right in front of you. So, I mean, every little nook and cranny on these cars is so designed and fantastic. And this is a good example. You know, it's a, co a company by its original exhaust. It's got books, tools, uh, it's Ferrari service uh, history. It, it's got everything you want to do on something, one of, something like uh, one of these. So, you know, again, this is the most developed version of this car. And, and I kind of feel like we're getting to that point where it's really going to be time for these because they are special and they are unique. Another really unique car that you guys have in the sales in 1967 ESO Grifo GL Series 1 five-speed car, which is really, really cool in uh, in, in the Grifos. Uh, it's restored by a Mark Expert, uh, finished in uh, Rosa Cordova over tan leather interior. And it's a best-in-class winner, 2017 Amelia Island. So it's been down there. It's it's done what it's not needed to do, and it's been demonstrated as as what it needs to demonstrate. So, what do you think on Iso Grifos overall? They're kind of a, a unique, weird car, but it seems like they offer a lot. Uh, I've always loved the the Iso Grifo. It's it's one of uh, I I feel like I've you you've picked all these cars, and I've said that every one is one of my favorite cars of its respective era. So maybe I'm starting to sound like a broken record, but um, you know, I always thought the ESO Grifo design uh, was one of the great European uh, GT car designs of the 1960s. I've just always thought that it had really uh, crisp lines. I actually think the best uh, view of an ESO Grifo is the rear three quarter. I love the uh, rear panel and the tail lights. They always seem very uh, elegant to me. Um, you know, the ESO Grifo is an interesting one because it's one of these. Uh, Italian American hybrid cars where, you know, how do we make a high performance car that, uh, you know, looks like a Ferrari and goes like a Ferrari, but doesn't have the maintenance cost. Um, so, you know, you've got a car with an American V8, um, but really a, a sort of continental European GT car styling. And, and that's always appealed to me. I, I'm a guy who, who has raced a lot of, uh, small block Chevy powered cars. I, I like, uh, the sound and the torque of a, an American V8. So, you know, I, I, I also love European styling. So for me, it's, it's a great blend of, of those things. And, you know, you can take it to Napa Auto Parts when you, uh, you know, need to get some, uh, engine parts for it. So, uh, th that's always good too. Yeah. Something to be said for that. Certainly kind of the best of both worlds there. Probably my favorite car that you guys have, uh, listed so far. Um, and I'm willing to bet you're probably on the same page based on what you have hanging behind you on the wall there. 
1954 Alfa Romeo, 1900 CSS Touring Coupe. Uh, great Supla Jericho coach, coach work by Touring. Uh, it's got a recent re uh, restoration, and it's it's done in uh, the nettle green color, which is really sharp on that car. Stylishly appointed with tan leather uh, leather and cloth interior, and the bright work is excellent on this car. Brawny wire wheels. It's got the Tipo 1308, which is the uh, the two liter, which is my favorite engine of all time, to be perfectly honest. Uh, and it's documented and, and, and with communication from the Alfa Romeo Resim as well, which is really important. Um, numbers matching car. You know what you're getting with this one. I kind of feel like every collection needs a 1900 CSS. I'm assuming you're probably going to agree with me. What's what are your thoughts on this car? Well, uh, Darren, I, I've been close to Alpha 1900s throughout my life because Alpha 1900s were very near and dear to my family and to my dad. Uh, my dad's first collector car uh, that he vintage raced in Monterey was an Alpha 1900 Zagato uh, that he acquired back in the mid 70s. And over the years, we owned many, many 1900s in our family. We still have one left, which is a uh, Pininfarina bodied uh, 1900 uh, CS 1954, which uh, actually is within a hundred chassis numbers of, of this car. Um, so obviously I'm biased towards 1900s. My, my dad raced them in the Mille Miglia and, uh, you know, I have a close, close association with them. Uh, this is a really interesting car. Um, this is a CSS, a C meaning it, it's the short uh, Corto chassis. Um, this is the sort of more commonly seen, uh, Turing bodywork on the, uh, on the early style, which is really an exquisite design. I mean, at, at Groceria Turing, uh, with their super legera, uh, style of construction, which is a really interesting style of construction with these little thin tubes inside over which the, the body structure is sort of laid. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really a wonderful car that speaks to that La Dolce Vita period, uh, in Italy. And this one, uh, is interesting to me because of its original color, which it's been returned to. I don't know that I've ever seen another 1900 in this color, which is called a uh, verde ortica, which is nettle green. And when I, when I saw the pictures of it, I thought, huh, I, I don't know if that's a factory color. And then I learned more about it and I learned that it actually was, which you learn something new every day, uh, in this world. So, um, very attractive car. Looks like a beautiful restoration. I haven't yet seen that car in person, but I'm hoping I'll get a chance to take a spin around Amelia Island Parkway in it, um, in another few weeks. Yeah. There's nothing better than that. Uh, the sound of that of one of those things starting up. They are, they are fabulous, fabulous, fabulous little cars. No question. Another fabulous car that you guys have, and this one may be on the underrated side a little bit too, um, 1972 Maserati Ghibli SS 4.9 Coupe, black on black leather interior, uh, three owners known uh, from new, uh, it's got the obvious uh, desirable 4.9 liter engine option with a five-speed manual transmission, uh, just 61,000 original miles from new, and it's got an extensive history including a $60,000 four-year mechanical restoration performed recently on it. I mean, these cars, I think, kind of get lost in the mix a little bit sometimes, too, between the the, uh, the Daytonas and, and the Muras and things of that nature. But these are stout, strong, comfortable, fast cars. I mean, you know, 100, almost 180 mile an hour top speed on these when uh, when they were new. Fastest uh, Maserati uh, in period up to that point. Um, what, what do you see for these? Do you, uh, do you is it the shape? What, what is it that that uh, both sort of uh, attracts and, and maybe kind of doesn't attract people to these cars in the same way? That it does to the mirror of the Daytona. Candidly, I'd rather have one of these than a Daytona. Yeah, it's an interesting question, Darren. And you know, people's tastes change over time, and trends change over time. Um, I would agree with you that the Ghibli has certainly lagged behind in terms of interest, and certainly from a market perspective. And you know, one thing to point out there that I think maybe gets lost among some newer collectors who may not have the Sort of historical perspective about it is that the Ghibli was a direct competitor of the Daytona when it was new. Um, I think the MSRP on a Ghibli uh, was 18 or 19 grand. And I think it, it I, I actually had to look this up recently for a catalog description. I think the base price on a Ghibli was actually a thousand dollars or so more uh, than a Daytona when the cars were new. So it's interesting when you look at them today. Uh, where they essentially were on a par when they were new. They cost 18 or 20 grand out the door, um, in, you know, 1972. Um, and, and today, you know, the, the Ghibli, give or take, is worth about a third of a Daytona. So on that, you know, sort of relative intrinsic value basis, the Ghibli is the clear winner there. Um, I think, you know, design is a very subjective thing and, and what some people like, other people may think is grotesque and, and vice versa. 
Um, to me, the, the Daytona is a more compelling design. I, I like the lines of the car better than the Ghibli, um, but that's purely a personal preference. And, um, you know, others would, would choose the Ghibli. So, you know, the car with the horse on the front is probably always going to be worth more. That's just kind of how uh, markets have reacted over time. Ferraris are worth more than Maseratis, and that probably isn't going to change. But on a relative value basis, I think a Ghibli is a very compelling proposition. Yeah, I mean, and I think part of that too is a V8 versus V12 situation. But, you know, the, the Ghibli was a powerful, powerful car. There's no question about it. Without a doubt. Yeah. Yep. Uh, moving on to British cars. Uh, 1967 Aston Martin DB6 Mark I. Uh, finished in silver birch over black leather interior, restored in 2006 with Mark II upgrades, and there's a bunch of those on this car. Uh, it's a matching numbers engine, uh, upgraded to Vantage specification, and it features a five-speed uh, Tremec transmission, including a spare ZF as well. Uh, additional upgrades, uh, Mark II fender flares, wider wheels, steel wing handling kit. When you think about kind of the original DBs, the four, the five, and the six, it seems like the, the six may not get the same credit that five does but i kind of think these are better cars for a bunch of reasons they're certainly more developed um where do you feel like these kind of fall in the hierarchy of these and and does it make them an, an excellent buy above and beyond because of of sort of the lack of pop culture reference to these cars yeah i mean i think clearly there is an evolution there um both in design and and technical aspects and the db6 is the car that followed on from the db5 so you know presumably it's a better developed and, and more technically advanced car um you know of of the three that you mentioned db4 5 and 6 i've personally always thought that the db4 was the prettiest of the three um the the sort of most purest uh, expression of the original sort of design language um, but the DB5, of course, is the one that, that gets all the credit and commands the big money because of uh, James Bond and, and Sean Connery and, and the Pop Cultural Association. So I think, you know, to, to the average guy walking down the street who's not an Aston Martin expert, uh, they probably aren't going to know a DB6 from a DB5, or at least the DB6 is going to be passable and look like the James Bond car. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that, again, on a relative basis, if you're looking at a DB5 versus a DB6, um, you, you might as well buy a DB6 and, you know, put 700 grand in, in the bank or into treasuries or something else. Um, uh, but, you know, the market over time has, has clearly gravitated towards the DB5 and those are still the cars that bring the big money. Th this one's got some really nice upgrades. Um, and, and, and I would say, you know, Aston collectors, uh, at least for people who are going to drive their cars seem to be maybe more receptive to certain types of upgrades than, um, collectors of other marks. Um, this one does have a Tremec five speed, which is, you know, a modern transmission, but is going to provide uh, a much better, you know, drivability sort of experience. And, you know, the engine has been upgraded to the Vantage higher horsepower specification, which, you know, is, is, I would say a desirable upgrade in, in today's market. I wonder about asking sometimes like this, if, if the James Bond thing didn't happen, where the DB5 would fall into the hierarchy of this. And I, I kind of feel like it would be towards the bottom. I agree with you completely on the DB4. I think it's the best, most pure one. But again, DB6 looks a lot like a James Bond car. Like you said, the guy in the street is not going to know the difference of that. And, and, and it, you get kind of a lot more, I feel like, with that car overall. So, and Mick Jagger had one, which is pretty cool too. So if you want to go pop, pop, pop culture references, there you go. Um, probably the most iconic British car of all time. And it seems like they're kind of having another market moment right now. They were, they were kind of slumping a little bit. And now they're definitely way back up. Um, 1964 Jaguar E-Type Series 1 3.8 Roadster, former 100-point car at the uh, Jaguar Club of Southern Arizona Concours. Uh, beautiful period correct, uh, Carmen Red over tan, 72,000 original miles, um, fully restored both mechanically and cosmetically with all the receipts included, which we all know is not cheap to do on those cars. Uh, offered with the original data plate uh, and additional tools, jacks, uh, and it's it's been documented with a Jaguar Heritage Trust certificate. This car's great, obviously, but wh where do you see kind of E-types going overall? It does seem like they are kind of hot again right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it goes in waves, um, you know, like many cars like this. So the E-type is arguably sort of the the bellwether car for, you know, 1960s European sports and GT car values. And, you know, prices fluctuate. I, I would agree with you that, um, E types have been very strong in the last few years. Although I would also say that, um, it's a model where you see, like many other models today, an extreme segregation 
in values based on relative quality. Um, because the fact is, you know, Jaguar did make a, a fair number of E-types and the survivor numbers are very high. And those cars run the gamut from, you know, cars that are in the million pieces in the garage that, you know, uh, rusty project cars to, you know, sort of middle of the road drivers from 25 years ago that, you know, had some paint slapped on them to the, you know, current hundred point JCNA show cars. And I think you see an increasing level of stratification and values from, you know, sort of call it good, better, best. Um, I haven't seen this, uh, the Carmen Red car in person, but obviously it, it, it was a previous hundred point award winner at a Jaguar Club Concourse. So I'm expecting it to be pretty nice when I see it in person. I can't tell you how many E types I've seen in my career and sold in my career. Um, but definitely one of the bellwether cars for, for this market. Yeah, quality is king on that, no doubt. Um, one of the things that Amelia Island is especially known for is Porsche. And you guys got a couple of really interesting examples. Um, first one up that caught my eye, night, uh, 2016 Porsche 911R. Super low miles on this thing, 1,683 miles. So very uh, restrained owner. I don't know how he did it. Uh, one of just 991 Porsche 911R sold worldwide and just one of 296 delivered to the United States. Interesting car. It's it's got the engine of the GT3 RS, six speed transmission. However, it's wingless. Kind of looks like a regular old 911. Um, that delivered originally to Porsche's uh, in the Porsche's communication color of Carrera white with red stripes at the Porsche Experience Center in Atlanta. And we all know that when you get into one of these cars brand new, you start checking those boxes and the prices go up really fast on them. Thirty thousand dollars in additional options on this car, including leather interior. A uh, single mass flywheel with reinforced clutch, front axle lift, sport chrono, and LED headlights with dynamic light system. This is a future collectible for sure. Low production, you know, it's got kind of all the goodies. It's kind of a mashup of greatest hits type of car for, for Porsche. Historically there, well optioned. Where do you see this going, you know, in, in early March and then on in the future? Yeah, I, you know, Porsche has done a masterful job of uh, liberating money from their clients' pocketbooks by creating all manner of, uh, you know, special editions of, to me, varying level of levels of interest and, and with their special wishes program and, and option book, which is quite extensive. I think that generally on a lot of the special edition cars, some of them are going to stand the test of time. Some of them are not going to stand the test of time as well as others. Of the ones that are going to stand the test of time, I would put the 911 R at or near the top. You know, the 911 R moniker goes back to the original 911 R of the 1967 period. And, you know, that is not a moniker that Porsche applies lightly. And I think it's different than, oh, you know, this is the new 50th anniversary, uh, you know, special edition with a different colored crest and different colored stitching on the seats. Uh, th this has sort of more oomph to back it up. Um, th this car, I think notably, uh, in a period where Porsche was sort of moving away from three pedal cars and manual gearboxes, this car does have the six speed, uh, manual gearbox, uh, it does have the GT3 RS engine. So this isn't just a decal kit. Um, you know, this is a serious performance oriented car. And, you know, you have the rarity factor where there are only 991 of these cars sold worldwide. To put it in perspective, there were I think about 1,573 Carrera RSs, which is you know, one of Porsche's other most collectible models. So, you know, from a rarity standpoint, it definitely ticks the box. From a technological, mechanical standpoint, it definitely ticks the box. And this particular example, uh, for all the things that are important to um, sort of investment-oriented buyers today, uh, not only the low mileage of, of 1,600 uh, or just under 1,700 miles. And by the way, you asked about restraint. I'm pretty sure the client who consigned this car bought it with about five or 600 miles on it and drove it about 1,000 miles. And then they said, okay, enough. Let's not put too many miles on it. So they did get to use it a little bit. Um, you know, don't worry about that. Um, but the other interesting thing about this car is that it does have a very high sticker relative to other 911 Rs. You mentioned, I think, over $30,000 in, in options. I think this one had an MSRP of 217 for memory, which is quite, uh, quite a lot. And notably, it does have the single mass flywheel, um, and, and some of the other very desirable options. So I think that this is going to be a good long term hold. And I do think that the 911 R, as the decades go by, is going to be one of these special edition Porsche cars that is going to have sustained interest. Yeah. A lot going on with that car. Last of a dying breed for sure.
Another Porsche that has a lot going on with it too, 1995 Porsche 911 Cup Car 3.8 liter, uh, originally ordered by Bridgestone Tire Company and then sent directly to the United States to promote the, promote the inter introduction of the Bridgestone SO2 tire, uh, entrusted to uh, motorsports legends, uh, people that really know what they're doing with the car, set up and maintained by Royal Racing through uh, about the 1995 year. Rare factory Porsche uh, race car, numbers matching engine, which is uh, unique as well. Uh, approximately 40 made for 1995. Uh, and this is the only example delivered to the United States. Uh, it's possibly the only cup car, uh, 3.8, fitted with a three-piece BBS center lock wheels. And it's participated in a bunch of stuff, including the Porsche Parade in Portland, uh, class Conco uh, Cor Concord class winner. And it was on the uh, cover of Excellence Magazine in April of 1996. It seems like race cars kind of go in a bunch of different directions sometimes, but this one kind of does a lot of stuff. And right now seems like the right time for a car like this. And Amelia, in all honesty, is probably the right place to sell this car. This thing to me looks like it's going to do pretty well. What are your thoughts here? So I hope I'm not jumping ahead too much, Darren. Um, this was actually going to be my buy pick for the buy, sell, hold a portion of the uh, podcast. Um, so, you know, for me, I was born in 1984. So uh, I, I remember these cars and I remember the Porsche Super Cup series in, in Europe at that time. And, you know, some of the, the best racing of all time, actually that whole era with Porsche Super Cup and British Touring Car, there was some really great uh, production car racing going on all over Europe at that time. And uh, these 3.8 Cup cars to me are very interesting. Um, this one in particular, uh, I think has a great livery and a, a great story. Um, we actually just sold another uh, 3.8 cup car, another uh, similar car to this at our Palm Beach auction to a good friend and client of mine who's going to have that car on the track at the Rensport reunion. And, you know, one of the things I like about these cars is that they are increasingly eligible for vintage racing. And with, with all of the, you know, Porsche centric events uh, going on, Luftecolt and Rensport reunion, all this kind of stuff. There's so many ways to actually be able to use this car. This is a very usable car for somebody who wants to go vintage racing. Um, and you know, it's, it's a 911. So it's not like it's so technologically advanced that you need to hire a team of X Formula One mechanics to run the thing. You know, it can be, I think, effectively used without, um, breaking the bank. I mean, racing is always going to be expensive, but I think this is a car that. Uh, the buyer will hopefully be able to exercise on the track and get a lot of enjoyment out of. And, you know, uh, if it was me, I, I would have this thing at Laguna Seca for Rensport next year if I was the buyer, if I was so lucky to be the buyer of it. Yeah, this is going to be a rock star at Rensport for sure. I mean, you can do anything with this car. You can you can race it. You can show it. it. It checks a ton of boxes for sure. Really, really, really interesting car. And, and you know, how many factory built Porsche race cars can you buy for um, you know, call it $300,000, give or take. Um, you know, I think that's pretty compelling from a market standpoint. A lot of bang there for your buck. No doubt about that. Okay, David, you've got this car thing in your blood. You're out in the world doing car stuff more than just about anybody on earth is. Uh, so let's, uh, we'll, we'll cut to the chase here. We know what you're going to buy. You're going to buy a, uh, a Porsche cup car. What are you going to sell? What are you going to hold in Amelia Island this year? Yeah, so, you know, like most collectors, because I'm not just a uh, an auction guy, I, I collect cars myself, and I'm, I'm probably better at buying them uh, myself than I am at selling them. Uh, you know, on the sell side, I think one area where I see a lot of saturation in the market is the, the current market for vintage 4x4s and SUVs. Um, I'm talking about the the 71 Broncos and the FJ40 Land Cruisers and the International Harvesters. I feel like this is a market that, um, you know, I think certainly with the Land Cruisers seems to have peaked. But in other cases, prices seem to be quite strong. And, you know, I, I look at the market from a what I call an intrinsic value basis. What cars do I think offer a lot of value for the price they cost to obtain and what cars do not? And when I'm looking at some guy spending... 150 grand for a 71 Bronco resto mod. I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, it probably wouldn't be my money. No, that's not to say, you know, there's a place for that and everybody enjoys cars in, in their own way. Um, but I, I think that's a market where there's been a lot of saturation, a lot of people rushing in to put their own custom builds on the market. Um, so at a certain point, I think supply and demand kind of meet and prices go down. Um, so that would be sort of my sell pick. And what are we, uh, what are we going to hold this year? 
Yeah, you know, that's a tough one. As you said earlier, it's a, it's a tougher question than it seems on the face of it. Um, I guess I'm, you know, looking at certain cars that I'm sort of interested maybe in acquiring that feel like the market is starting to move a little bit, but but maybe has more room to run. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at uh, the non-E30 BMW M3s. I'm looking at E36s and E46s and E92s, which still seem to me to offer good value for money and, you know, probably have a, a reasonably bright uh, collectability and market future. Um, I'm also looking at things like uh, Porsche 996 turbos, which were way too cheap for a long time and have started to move a little bit. But, you know, you can still get a whole lot of car for uh, 50 or 60 grand. So I guess those would be some of my uh, my hold picks right now. Yeah, that that, uh, that era is definitely coming for sure. Maybe not the OJ Broncos, but uh, certainly uh, the the M3s, BMWs, and and again, you're right. 420 horsepower, zero to 63.9 seconds. Those uh, those 996 turbos are a massive amount of car for the money. And and candidly, I think those headlights have aged well. I think they're exotic and they're a little bit different, maybe than than uh, some of the standard fare. So I I think I think the ceiling is is high on those cars. Well, you know, I think that the time for uh, poo-pooing the headlights, you know, it, it was only about 10 years ago that uh, any impact bumper 911 was sort of out of style. Um, and, you know, as, as we said earlier on this podcast, trends change over time. And I always remind anybody who has anything to say about the headlights that the Porsche 911 GT1 had the same headlights. So that's that's my thought there. Yeah, and, and I mean, you know, you look at things like, you know, 911 SCs, those were $20,000 cars for years, and they're not $20,000 cars anymore. Any final thoughts? Yeah, Darren, I uh, just want to say it's been a pleasure to be on the show with you today. Thanks for having me. I would invite uh, any of the listeners to check us out at www.broadarrowauctions.com, where you'll find our Amelia cars uh, being added. I think by the time this episode airs, we should have the entire catalog online. And also check out our private sale cars at www.collectorsgarage.com. Yeah, there's always a lot going on at Broad Arrow, no question about that. I would like to thank David Swig for joining us today. To learn more about anything that we discussed here, be sure to pick up the latest issue of Sports Car Market Magazine by visiting the link in the video description down below. As a reminder, if you enjoyed this content, please take a moment to like and share this video, and don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay on top of future episodes. I'm Darren Robert, and thank you for joining us on the Buy, Sell, Hold Spotlight. <laughs>